Well, good uh, morning, everybody. As we open our service this morning, uh, hear these words from Psalm 95, which enjoins us to sing songs of praises. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Please stand with me as we sing, Give Us Clean Hands. seated. Good morning and a warm welcome uh, to you all. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in this wonderful spring morning that the Lord has made. Uh, Psalm 122 in verse 1 reads, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so this morning we too are glad that uh, due to the re uh, relaxed COVID regulations. We are back in one service at 8.30 on a Sunday, and uh, so it, uh, it's really great to see so many faces, and uh, even if they are for the moment still behind masks, um, it's nice to be together. Uh, special welcome to any newcomers or visitors. Uh, we thank you for joining us on this Lord's Day. Uh, you're most welcome. And uh, please do fill in a visitor's card and let us know of any spiritual or prayer needs that you may have. 
And uh, we ask the members and the regular attenders, uh, look out for someone who may be new and uh, that uh, you can greet them and make them feel welcome. And uh, so in your interactions, uh, we ask you please to remember to observe the social distancing and uh, COVID-19 regulations uh, concerning masks. And uh, as from next week, we will be having tea again uh, in the morning after the service. So that'll be uh, you know, a great time uh, just to reconnect with, with people and to welcome new people. And don't be afraid if because of the lockdown you've forgotten someone's name. Uh, the easiest way to find out someone's name is to say, hello, what is your name? Or I'm Walter, what is your name? And uh, I'm sure they'll forgive you. Maybe not the uh, fourth and fifth time you do it, but uh, still. <laughs> so uh, the restrooms are in the adjoining uh, building out to your left, and the entrance to the cry room is situated uh, also off the covered walkway of the adjoining building. Please bow with me as uh, we uh, open in prayer. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together in fellowship this morning to praise and to worship you. We yearn for a closer walk with you, Lord Jesus, that we may draw ever closer into your arms of grace. Thank you that the COVID restrictions have been eased so that our body can come together in one service to commune with you in prayer, song, and the reading and teaching of your word. Help us to increasingly seek you, and may we honor and love you for who you truly are, our Savior and our Lord. May we spend time in your presence, not for what we can get from you, but for what we can give of ourselves, for the good of the body and for your glory. Lord, fill us with your love, so that our love may flow back to you, as well as out to one another. We pray that our lives may be ones that glorify you today, and each day in our thoughts, words, and deeds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, the announcements will now come up on the screen, and uh, I ask that you pay careful attention to them. Thank you.
So there's just a few of the notices that I want to emphasize. The first one is that the members meeting is uh, after the service this morning at 10.30 and uh, all, of, all members of Midrand Chapel are encouraged to attend. Uh, visitors and those who are not yet uh, uh, members but would like to become members are uh, also invited to attend so that you can see how Midrand Chapel is led and uh, how Midrand Chapel is administered and you'll also get an update on a lot of the things that are happening in the ministries and the Bible study groups so uh, we really encourage you all to attend. Um, then uh, uh, just a reminder the ladies fellowship on the 9th of October that is not next Sunday but the uh, next Saturday but the Saturday after uh, from 8 o'clock until 11 o'clock so the uh, topic is depression uh, causes and cures and uh, the talk is by Francis um, Waddle uh, who was saved by God's grace in 1986 and born again to a living hope but she was confused by unbiblical counsel and trapped by destructive emotions. Uh, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, hers is a story of a hopeless life uh, truly transformed by God. And uh, so really um, uh, it's very worthwhile to come to bring along somebody else, a friend or someone who you feel might uh, benefit from hearing this talk. And uh, so uh, please register. And uh, there's also will be a bring and share. So when you register, if you could just indicate uh, what it is that uh, you will be bringing in that day. Um, and then uh, just a reminder as well, the visitor's information and welcome lunch. Uh, that's on uh, the 3rd of October, so next week. And uh, again, please RSVP by responding to the welcome email uh, that was sent uh, to you or to SMS or WhatsApp uh, Frank. Um, perhaps the most important announcement there is that this evening's prayer meeting is at 5 p.m. on site and on Zoom, and, uh, but we really encourage as many of you as are able to attend uh, on site for that prayer meeting. So as uh, Christians, we need to celebrate the love and the majesty of God. It is essential uh, to being a Christian and to maintaining a joyful and a grateful heart. Uh, the Bible calls us to worship and to praise the glory of God. And uh, this morning's scriptural call to worship is Psalm 100, which I will read. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Please uh, stand with me as we sing our second song, Turn Your Eyes. Savior ever true, oh Jesus. 
seated. Uh, I now call on our brother Michael Felton for today's scripture reading taken from Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32, um, verses 1 to 32. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country 
and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that I may come, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he stayed there that night, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking cows and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he stayed, he himself stayed that night in the camp. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Thank you, Michael. Um, please now stand with me as we sing our third song, O Church Arise. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ, our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the to rage against the captain and with the sword that makes the wounded whole we will fight with faith and valor when faced with trial Oh uh -huh. 
see his paws lies crash beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and christ emerges from the grave this victory march continues till the day every eye and heart shall see Spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may ride with faith to win the prize, as servant good and faithful, as saints of seated. Usually at this time the stewards would come forward and take up the offering uh, in offering bags, but uh, in these uh, COVID times uh, most offerings are being made by EFT. Uh, however, if you do have a physical offering that you'd like to make, uh, please place it in the offering box in the foyer after the service. So now to prepare us for our prayer this morning, I read from 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 to 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Please bow with me. Father, we praise you that you are a God who makes wonderful promises. We praise you that you promise life, peace, and joy. You promise a world ruled by a perfect ruler who loves and cares for his subjects. Father, we praise you that you are always faithful in all of your promises. We thank you that for those who love you, for those who are called according to your purpose, you work all things together for good and for your glory according to your perfect will and in your perfect timing. We praise you that we can have complete confidence in your promises, including the promise that one day we will see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face in glory. Father, we praise you that you make your promises to those like us, who do not deserve them. We praise you that those who you foreknew you have also predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. We thank you that you have called us, that you have justified us, that you are sanctifying us, and that you will glorify us. You have done all that was necessary for these promises to come to fulfillment that you have sent your Son to seal the covenant of your promises in his own blood, 
so that we may have the confidence that though our sins are scarlet, you will wash them white as snow. Father, we come before you as our maker and our judge, conscious of our rebellion against you, conscious that though you are our provider and our sustainer, we do not appreciate what you have done for us as we ought. We confess that even our redeemed hearts are at times very cold towards you, and we do not fully value your worth. We owe you our being for having made us and for having redeemed us. Father, we confess that we do not do your will and that throughout our lives we are inclined to reject what you have said is good and pursue and embrace that which is evil. Father, as we consider our sin, we are convicted of how little we pray to you that sin might not reign in our hearts, how little we cry out to you for strength to resist sin in our lives. We pray that you would give us a greater concern for obedience so that we would pray daily for your strength to resist evil. We bring our hearts that value so many of the wrong things before you, Lord, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, ask that you incline your ear towards us, hear our prayer, have mercy upon us, forgive us, cleanse us, and transform us. Lord, we thank you that you have desired to glorify yourself and that you have desired to love us as part of that. Thank you for calling us in your word to cast all our cares on you. You have proven yourself faithful over and over again, and so we make the needs of the members of our body known publicly because we know that you are faithful and we desire to bring glory to you. Lord, we pray for the members of this congregation that are in special need and facing difficulties at this time. You know who is in need and what these needs are. Physical needs, financial needs, health needs, family needs, and spiritual needs. O oh God, we pray that you would, by your grace, meet all these needs. Lord, we know that all authority over us all in authority over us have been placed there by you. Father, we pray for the salvation of our president and his cabinet, as well as the salvation of other political leaders in our country. We pray that you would cause them to govern wisely, and we pray that the candidates and political parties who would best serve the practical needs of our communities through the local government structures would emerge victorious after the upcoming elections. We pray for a peaceful run-up to the election, free of intimidation and violence. Lord, we pray for our own congregation and our corporate and individual responsibility for evangelism. We pray that we would make use of every opportunity you present us to share the gospel. We pray that we would not be ashamed of the gospel and that we would share the good news of Jesus Christ in love, grace and humility. We pray that you would give us hearts that won't rest until we have shared the gospel with those you have placed within our reach. We pray that we would each day reflect the Lord Jesus Christ to those around us. And here in our own congregation, we pray that we would love one another and that we would show kindness and care even in small and simple ways to those around us. We lift our brother, Victor Munsami, up to you and pray uh, for his recovery, for wisdom for the doctors in treating his health. Uh, we thank you that our sister Patricia Zuse was able to see uh, a doctor last week and uh, that they have made an accurate diagnosis. And we pray, Lord, that she would soon be able to see a doctor uh, and uh, that you would open the way for her to have the necessary medical procedure that she needs to alleviate her of the pain that she's suffering. We pray for the hearts of the children and teachers at Carlfontaine to be open to the love of Christ. We praise you for the birth of Scarlett, Michaela, Zilch, born to Craig and Keita. And uh, we pray for our two Solar Five churches, Central Baptist Church in Gaborone, Botswana, and the Fellowship of Believers in Christ in Nampula, 
Mozambique. May your truth be accurately and boldly taught by these churches. Lord, we give you thanks for all that you have given us, not least of which is your grace that we know through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gifts and offerings we have received and pray that we would be faithful stewards of what you have entrusted to us. We pray that through our giving, your word would spread and bring you glory. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Uh, we will now be dismissing the children uh, that attend child care, which takes place in the house outside the main hall for children aged two years to grade one. Uh, this does not include the Sunday school children. Uh, the Sunday school would take place uh, during the members' meeting um, this, this morning. And uh, so while the children are entering, are exiting, uh, please stand and sing our fourth song, Nothing But the Blood. Be seated. Well, good morning from me. Caroline was stressing at that announcement because she's one of the Sunday school teachers and with Brian coordinates Sunday school and Sunday school only starts next week. So you're welcome to take your kids over to the house during the members meeting. Just go with a book or something to read to them. Um, and then just uh, again from my side, an uh, uh, invitation to you to say after the church, uh, especially if you're visiting us, welcome. And uh, please stay after that we can uh, introduce ourselves to you and get to know you a bit. And a reminder to our members to make use of that opportunity. Um, we have a number of uh, returning visitors and new members and uh, we don't all recognize each other with these masks. 
Um, uh, last week at VWA, I didn't know who she was. She's in our Bible study. I've seen her, I don't know how many times. So I didn't even know her name. I do know her name. I just didn't know it was her. So, you know, I'm just mentioning that because we're all going through this. Uh, people we know we don't recognize anymore and people we used to know we don't know anymore and all of those things. But don't let that stop you from um, engaging with each other. So let me pray for us. Father, now as we come to your word, we ask for your grace. Give us what we don't deserve, haven't earned, and never will deserve. Give us your son in fuller measure. Show us your glory as it's seen in the face of Jesus. Show us your truth. Send your spirit, Lord, with power to take your word and... um, Apply it to each one of our hearts personally and specifically. Father, please help me to teach your word with clarity and with conviction um, in a way that is worthy uh, of the revelation that you've given us. And help those who hear to hear with faith and understanding and help them to be transformed as they fellowship with you uh, around your word. Father, we know that it is sacred for us to be gathered in the name of Christ as your people with your word open before us. And we know we desperately need the transformation uh, that you bring in times like this. So please be at work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been working our way through the the letter to the Romans and we got to the end of Romans chapter 8 and then I skipped over to Romans chapter 12 uh, partly because I wanted to connect the indicatives of the first chapters of Romans with the imperatives of the um, second part of Romans. I wanted to show how the gospel that we've been studying and uh, learning about in the opening chapters of Romans relates to the life that we are living, the context that we find ourselves in. Uh, it's practical and we need to think about how to apply it in the midst of all of these realities. So I called the series uh, Applying Gospel Medicine to COVID Sickness. And I've been uh, careful to point out that I'm not talking about how the gospel is going to help us with the actual virus, um, but uh, how it is going to help us and should help us deal with all the secondary effects that COVID has brought into our lives, into our world. And we've been looking at some of those harmful effects, so sometimes more harmful than the disease itself. And so we looked at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, how we've been saved to worship. We're called to sacrifice ourselves to make much of God. And we can't lose sight of that main purpose for which we save. We can't let COVID distract us into mere survival. We are here to make much of God, and that's what we ought to be busy with. Uh, we looked at Romans 12, 2, how we need to resist the pressures of the world um, and saturate our lives and our minds with God's truth. And again, in a world that is you know, constantly changing and, uh, and confusing, and we're not sure what we should do, God's Word is our guide, and it's our light. And we need to make sure we're renewing our minds so that we can understand what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, and so we can walk in it. And then we looked at Romans 12, verse 3 to 8, how as believers we are members one of another. We are interdependent. And God has has saved us and gifted us and called us to take up a unique place in His church. And uh, the significance of the church and our place in it hasn't changed because of COVID. And so we need to find ways to take up our place and to use our gifts for the building up of the church. That's what we're called to. And then in Romans 12, verses 9 to 13, we saw how God has called us to love others in the church, uh, to build relationships of significance, of eternal significance, that we're not just to get busy doing things. We get, we, we, we're to get busy building relationships with people uh, and building into their lives. Now, the remaining verses in Romans chapter 12, that's what I want to finish out this week, just to close out chapter 12 before we go back to Romans chapter 9. And they all have to do with the very real and significant obstacles that you and I are going to face as we seek to build loving relationships with people. As we seek to build into people's lives, what is it that we're going to face? 
as a result of the fallenness of this world. So you can turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We'll pick up from verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I think that final verse there summarizes not only this paragraph, but the whole chapter. You know, what is the gospel calling us to? It's calling us to a life that will not be overcome by evil in all its various forms, but overcome the evil with good. But specifically in the context of relationships, as it bears uh, on our attempts to take the gospel to people and live it out amongst people. Uh, the World Economic Forum has got a website which lists the following technology trends as a result of COVID. Things that COVID has catapulted um, um, and causing to become more influential and prominent in our society. Online shopping, digital and contactless payment, remote work, distance learning, telehealth, online entertainment, robotics and drones, 5G information and, com and communication technologies. There were two more. But these shouldn't be completely shocking to you, right? You've experienced some of these things. And it's, it's maybe significant to stop and realize eight of the ten um, influences are pulling us away from people. Eight of the ten technologies or uh, changes in our society as, as a result of COVID are creating greater distance between us and other people. That's almost what they're designed to do, and that's certainly their effect. And so, as I've heard, you know, one of the effects of COVID is it's put us into these little bubbles, uh, and we've reached out to one another only in virtual forms and remained in relative isolation from one another. And even as COVID restrictions have begun to be relaxed, I've heard people expressing the sense of isolation, the sense of estrangement, the sense of loneliness that they felt, and yet at the same time saying they're finding it difficult to enter back into these relationships, back into uh, life as it were. COVID sickness or COVID-related sickness has even made the extroverts amongst us a little bit antisocial. Isn't it so? At some level, we've enjoyed the isolation. At some level, we've come to feel safe in our bubbles. And we've enjoyed the simplicity of a lifestyle that is um, a, a lot lighter on relationships and in some ways, therefore, a lot simpler and easier to deal with. It's true. But the gospel calls us to move out into relationships this is what the message of the gospel is. Jesus Christ left the comforts of heaven to enter the fallenness and the wickedness and the sinfulness and the depravity and the pain and the lostness of our world on a mission to reconcile men and women to God. That is the gospel. And therefore those who are ambassadors of the gospel need to carry that message of God's commitment to reconcile men to him and to one another, and the means by which he's accomplished that in Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel has to be seen not only in its ability to reconcile men to God, but to reconcile people to one another. That's where we see what the gospel is accomplishing. 
They will know, Jesus said, we are Christians by our love for one another. This is how they will know that the gospel has transformed us. As Jesus Christ is formed in us and his character moves out through us and is expressing itself in love that seeks reconciliation. So five obstacles to sowing gospel peace in relationships. That's what this passage has got for us. A number of obstacles, five of them I want to look at. And I want you to consider this this morning. The reality of the difficulty of being a peacemaker. Just how hard it is. Because we've got to recognize as we seek to serve Christ and the gospel, we've got to recognize it is hard. But we're still called to it. And we're given the means to overcome even these obstacles. So the first one here is persecution. Persecution. In verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. So persecution is suffering for doing good. It's when we try to do good, we try to serve another person, we're serving Christ, we're standing up for what is right, we're sharing the gospel with another person, we're confronting sin, and we face backlash as a direct result of that. It's when we move into a relationship trying to represent Christ and His glory and His values and, and we're trying to do this for the good of this person. We're trying to help them. But somehow they don't see it that way. And they retaliate against us for, for the very good we've been trying to do and the very Christ-likeness we've been showing. That can be hard to accept. If we don't realize that persecution is something that we will face as we seek to serve Christ, then when we face it, we're going we're gonna to be you know, disorientated and discouraged. And we're going to want to withdraw from relationships because now we're facing heat. Now we're facing difficulty. Now our reputation is being damaged and our comfort is being affected. Or we're going to either withdraw from the relationship totally or we're going to withdraw from serving Christ in it. We're going to stop sharing the gospel or we're going to stop speaking the truth or we're going to stop reaching out in love. And we're going to rather not do that because it's becoming too painful and too difficult. Now each of these obstacles, there's an external obstacle. There's the persecution that this person is responding to me with. But there's also an internal obstacle that needs to be overcome. And this highlights one of the internal obstacles that I face as I seek to move out in, in loving other people. And that is my desire for comfort, my desire for preservation. Very often we get into relationships in the first place because we want something out of them. We want some benefit from this person. We want to be helped. We want to be served. We want to be comforted. We want to get something good out of this relationship. So when nothing good comes out of it, but just the opposite, we feel uncomfortable, we get accused, we find difficulty, then we just say, I'm out of this. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. We stop doing what Christ has called us to do in the relationships because we are seeking to preserve ourselves and our comfort. And that's one obstacle we need to overcome internally irrespective of that person, to say, I need to serve Christ and be willing to suffer for that. That's the first obstacle. Second obstacle, context and experience. In verse 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. So as we seek to enter into relationships, we're coming from a, two different places. We're coming from two different contexts two different sets of experiences. And as we come and try and meet this person, they're coming from their own context and their own experience. And that creates a barrier in us coming together in loving relationship, peaceable relationship. He's just received a promotion, and I've just been retrenched. And that makes this meeting difficult. Or the other way around. I've just received a, motion, a promotion and he's been retrenched and now we're getting together for lunch. But the different places we're coming from makes that lunch now feel awkward and difficult. 
I've just had a baby and she's just had a miscarriage. I've just found out my cancer test is clear and she's just starting chemo on Monday. My son has just come to faith and been baptized. Her son has just left the home and moved in with his boyfriend. We've just bought a new house and they've just had their house repossessed. And that makes it difficult. I've just passed my exam cum laude and he has just failed and must repeat the year. And we're coming together in relationship from such different backgrounds and these different backgrounds form a, an obstacle. The disparity between our context and our experience makes it hard um, to come together in genuine love and unity and peace. Even if we originally come together in some sort of relationship because of some shared experience, over the long haul in life, life takes us in different directions and that creates greater and greater obstacles to us continuing in this relationship. Which is harder? Which is harder for the parent who's just celebrated their son's 21st birthday to go to the house of mourning in a family that's just lost their son in a car accident? Or is it harder for that family that have just lost their son in a car accident to go and celebrate the 21st birthday of this family? To rejoice with those who rejoice or to weep with those who weep? Which is harder? Well, there's some measure of... Uh, empathy when we are also the ones weeping, when we are also the ones rejoicing and we go to people that are rejoicing and we can uh, rejoice together. But it's hard to have empathy. It's hard to enter into someone's experience and context when it's very different from our own. And life in this world puts us into very different contexts and ha having very different experiences. And the gospel calls us to cross them in love. Not to wait till I have a good day when I have something to rejoice over and then seek out the brother or sister who's rejoicing and rejoice with them. But to take the hope of the gospel and to apply it to my pain in such a way that I can enter into this person's world and genuinely rejoice in the grace and the goodness of God as it's been expressed to them, knowing that that same grace and goodness is available to me. That's what the gospel calls us to do. And again, there's internal obstacles, right? To overcome this external obstacle of our disparity in experiences and context, we've got to overcome something in our hearts. The gospel has to overcome something in our hearts. I find myself jealous. Jealous of their good marriage. Jealous of their economic success or their possessions. Jealous of their house, or their awards, or their honor that they've received. Jealous of their comfort. Jealous of the good news that they have just received. I'm jealous of how God seems to be blessing them, and how he seems to be sending every kind of trial my way. And the gospel says we are God's beloved. Infinitely and eternally and unchangeably loved. Do you remember that? Do you remember that chapter 8? All that God is doing and has, do, has done and will do for those who have been adopted in a love relationship with Him, we need to apply that truth to that jealousy. Or we're selfish. We're selfishly ambitious. And sometimes we're jealous and selfish at the same time. Sometimes we... We are the ones rejoicing. We are the ones who have this nice car or this nice house or we are the ones who are you know, experiencing a period of easy going and, and life is bright and good and we don't want anyone infringing on that. We don't want anyone taking away from that joy with the grief and the burden and the difficulty that they're bearing. And so we distance ourselves from them. We keep ourselves away from them because we don't want that in our life. The gospel has taught us that there's something greater than our present experience. And that's the love of God in Jesus Christ. There's something more secure 
infinitely more secure than just holding on to this moment. And that is having Jesus Christ hold on to us. And that gospel should free us from having to protect ourselves from difficulty in the world. God's got our back. Do you remember that chapter? Do you remember that chapter? Do you remember eight chapters of a glorious gospel that calls us to be able to cross these internal barriers, overcome them, and therefore cross the external barriers and rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep? Third obstacle, cultural and economic disparity in verse 16. Cultural and economic disparity. It says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. And I think when he's saying live in harmony with one another, he's alluding to the tensions that existed in the church between Jews and Gentiles. He's been hammering on this since chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And then what does it say? To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Even as he thinks about the gospel, he can't think about it other than this, this message that reconciles Jews and Gentiles into one glorious body in Jesus Christ. The Jews and the Gentiles hated each other. They were enemies. They would have nothing to do with each other socially. There was a long history of wrongdoing on both sides, evils that they'd done against each other. There were significant cultural differences, the way they ate and fellowshiped, different values, different worldviews, different ways of dressing, different ways of relating socially. And not only was there racial and cultural tension, but there was economic tension. There were slaves and Roman citizens. And they were sitting together. Paul gives instructions to slaves and masters in Ephesians chapter 5. Can you imagine that? A master and a slave sitting together side by side in the pews as they listen to God's word. And the gospel calls them to cross all these barriers and to live in harmony and peace. When we try to serve Christ in relationships, these barriers of culture and ec ec um, economics and race and background and worldview are almost insurmountable. You seldom find the world managing to cross them. Do you realize that? As you look around in our world, the world around us, you see people, but they stick to their own kind. They stick to their own social grouping, their own level of ec economics and income. That's how the world deals with it, because the barriers are just too great to cross. And sometimes we bring that into the church. It's so, so difficult to find a managing director and a laborer sitting side by side over lunch, genuinely sharing their hearts with one another and caring for each other. Have you seen that? It's very, very rare. And yet, too, there's this internal obstacle that we must overcome to overcome these external obstacles. And it's pride and prejudice, not the book, the reality. <laughs> this very real obstacles, pride, thinking and believing that we are better and that we know better, that our culture is superior that because we have a degree or we drive a fancy car or we have our own office, uh, that we're fundamentally better than the person who has to walk to work or clean the toilets. And these two commands in verse 16, I think, address these attitudes. Do not be haughty. Do not be proud. Do not have this attitude, this internal mindset that's an obstacle to crossing these barriers that the gospel calls us to cross. Do not think that you're better than. Do not be wise in your own sight. Do not think that you know better and that you're living better than those people just because you smell better or smell different. That's what it's saying. I saw this clearly when I was uh, living, uh, studying and working in the States uh, because we, um, uh, the seminary students were highly respected on the campus, and the campus was on the same. Uh, the seminary was on the same campus as the church, and the seminary students all had to wear a suit and tie. 
So we stuck out like a sore thumb as we walked around. Um, I also worked as a janitor, basically, you know, setting out chairs, vacuuming carpets, cleaning toilets. Um, and the janitors had to wear a uniform, and we stuck out like a sore thumb. So I would go from classes in seminary, walk across to the change room, change into my janitor's uniform, and then go back to that same environment, the same rooms, and clean up the mess after everyone else, wearing a different uniform. I, I, I wasn't really mistreated, but I was certainly treated differently. I was surprised at how different the greetings were and the attitude was towards me. How often we were just ignored. How often we were given instructions as if we never had the capability to follow even basic English. You know how we do that sometimes? And I'm the same person. Nothing's changed but the clothes I'm wearing. But other people's view of me has changed. And that creates a barrier. And that pride and that prejudice goes both ways. I've been in the context where I'm the cultural minority and I don't want to go to this thing because I don't know the rules. I don't know how to behave. I don't know what's expected of me. I've been in that scenario where an event is being planned and, and, and it costs money and I don't have the money required and I'm too proud to even let anyone know. So I just don't go. And I find some reasons in my mind <clears throat> of how insensitive they are uh, to my condition. This pride and this prejudice goes both ways. And we don't want to invite people into my home. I've been in that scenario because, you know, my bed and my lounge are in the same room and my lounge consists of one couch and there's nowhere to sit. And so how can you have people in your home? These are the obstacles we need to overcome if we're going to cross these external obstacles. And the gospel says we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. All men are created equal, and we're saved by Jesus Christ by grace through faith in Him alone, and not in any goodness of our own, and not in any works or performance or degree or social or cultural value that is inherent in us. The gospel is a complete leveler. And so whether we find ourselves on the upside or the downside of these differences, we can cross them because of Jesus Christ, who crossed heaven to earth, the greatest obstacle to reconcile earth to heaven. Fourth obstacle, wrongdoing, in verse 17 and 18. It says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And this alludes to the reality of sin. As we seek to move out in relationships and, and build loving relationships for the glory of God and bring the gospel into those relationships, we're going to encounter the very thing that the gospel is for, and that is sin. We're going to encounter sin of all kinds and wrongdoing of all kinds. Every relationship in this world is characterized by sin and wrongdoing on both sides. There is no relationship other than what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, which is characterized by one-sided sin, one-sided wrongdoing, us repeatedly doing wrong against God and God not holding that against us but repeatedly reaching out in grace to reconcile us to himself. That's why the gospel calls us to move into these places where people sin against us, they gossip against us, they slander us, they judge our motives, they wrongly and insensitively confront us. People will sometimes steal from you, they'll waste your time, they'll damage your property, they'll hurt your feelings deliberately. People will do this they will reject your children. They will criticize your decisions. No relationship is going to survive unless we can apply the gospel to those realities. That is the reality of relationship in this world. And there's an internal obstacle that needs to be overcome by the gospel in our hearts in order to overcome the external obstacle of wrongdoing, bitterness and unforgiveness. But in our hearts, we harbor those hurts. We harbor that unforgiveness. And we don't apply the gospel, the God who forgave us, to make us willing to forgive. 
when we, sinned, when we are sinned against, we set about sinning back. We're going to do, or, you know, are we going to get them back? Or are we going to do what is right? That's what the text is asking us. Do what is right in the sight of all. Note the contrast there between verse 16 and 17. Do not be wise in your own sight. Do not do what is right in your own sight versus doing right in what is right in the sight of all. When we, when we are wrong, we find it very hard to be objective. We don't know what's right. We just know what we feel. But other people can see. And we build up this barrier of bitterness and unforgiveness that makes us want to get the other person back to get even, to pay them hurt for hurt, evil for evil. And only the gospel can remedy that. The gospel reminds us that we have sinned much and have been forgiven much. And we didn't deserve that forgiveness at all. And that's why Jesus could say in the Lord's Prayer, you know, forgive others even as your heavenly Father has forgiven you. It is not possible to withhold forgiveness and hold on to bitterness and anger in the heart and contemplate the gospel at the same time. It's not possible. When we harboring bitterness and unforgiveness, we are not thinking about the gospel. And that's why God puts us in a world and into relationships where that is the reality because it drives us as we find that hurt and we find that bitterness and anger building up. It drives us where? Back to the cross. It drives us back to the gospel to be reminded of the forgiveness we've received and to free us from that bitterness. Notice here what he says. Uh, in verse 18, if possible, so far it depends on you, live peaceably with all. In three ways, he's, he's expressing uncertainty here. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live it peaceably with all. It's not always possible. Sometimes you can do everything that is within your power to seek reconciliation, to seek peace, to pursue this person in love and forgiveness, and it doesn't result in reconciliation. That is the reality of relationships in this world. That is the reality. It's a two-way street. The text is urging us here, in this two-way street of relationships, make sure that the unforgiveness, that the obstacles, that, that the coldness of heart and the lack of love is not coming from you. Make sure that you continually offering to this person all that God has offered to you in the gospel. But accept that even such great grace offered will not always be returned with grace and forgiveness and reconciliation. And so we will go through this world where despite our best efforts, we will have broken relationships. And that should not lead us to withdraw and say, I'm not going to enter into any more. I'm not going to make the effort with this person. I'm not going to pursue that person just because it didn't always work out the way that I wanted it to with one particular scenario. Fifth obstacle that we're going to face as we move out in relationships is injustice. Injustice in verse 19 and 20. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. There's a second obstacle closely related to wrongdoing. But the second obstacle kicks in when the wrongs are not righted. When the sin is not dealt with, but continues on and on and on. When the damage that's been done by this person doesn't seem to be fixed. And, 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 and keeps spilling out into other people's lives, then there's something in us that rises up and says, I want justice. And it's not wholly wrong, because God is a God of justice. And God is a God who will right all wrongs, and He will even the scales, and He will correct everything. So it's not altogether wrong, but what is the problem with that? Is what the text says. In verse 19, vengeance is mine. It is God's prerogative and God's prerogative alone to mete out justice. He alone is creator and owner of all people. He alone is sinless. 
He alone is just. He alone makes a right evaluation of exactly what this person needs and what they deserve. And he will meter that out according to his judgment at the right time in right measure. And we can never get that right because we are not God. And when we want justice and vengeance, when we try and, and inflict that justice in a way in the form of vengeance, we are putting ourselves in the place of God. We're making ourselves God. This is a major theme in so many movies and books, and I hope you've picked up on it. Vengeance. And in most of those movies, getting the vengeance, getting the revenge, getting the person back is glorified and honored as, a, as an amazing thing, a right thing. And, and, and you all you know, have a sigh of relief at the end of the book when justice is finally brought on this evildoer. But this text says that thinking is wrong. God is the one who brings justice. And unless we can accept that, we're going to go through this world messing up relationships as we seek to apply law rather than grace. Did you hear me? There's, a, there's an internal obstacle that we need to overcome in order to overcome this external obstacle. And the internal obstacle is we set ourselves up as judge and lawgiver. And then we demand of people that they fulfill our requirements, our laws, our expectations for this relationship, for their behavior, and sometimes those judgments are right, but they're coming from us. And then we inflict law and punishments upon them when they don't fulfill our sense of justice. In a word, we take dominion. In relationships, we try to take dominion over people. And dominion belongs to God and God alone. And so rather than becoming channels of grace that hold out grace and forgiveness, we become channels of law and justice and control. And that's not what the gospel calls us to in relationships. There's a lot of different interpretations there in verse 19 about the um, verse 20. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Different ideas there. Bottom line is this. Whenever you encounter that phrase, burning coals in the Bible, it's got a negative connotation. And it's normally associated with God's judgment. And that fix, fits the context very well because the context, yeah, it's speaking about vengeance and I will repay. And so I think, you know, this text is, is simply just reinforcing, listen, we must do good. We must return evil with good. We must feed. We must, the hungry, we must give water to the thirsty. We must show hospitality to the wicked. And you say, how can we do that? Are we not supporting wrongdoing then? How can we be a part of that? How can we encourage this person that's so evil? Because that is our role, to be ministers of grace and mercy, to show people the grace and mercy of the gospel in very tangible ways, because they'll either be won by that grace, by the extension of that grace, or they'll be ripe for judgment. That's what the gospel does. The gospel extends God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ to sinners, and either they see that grace and that mercy and they lay hold of it and they receive the forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ or they reject it and then they write for judgment. They deserve everything that is coming their way. And God says in relationships, we need to be extending grace to others. Now just stop for a moment and think about your lives. Think about these obstacles. Persecution, different context and experience, culture and economic disparity, wrongdoing, injustice. Think about all these internal obstacles. Jealousy, selfishness, envy, pride, prejudice, self-preservation, bitterness and unforgiveness. 
and you can understand why the world is broken. This is where Romans began, didn't it? This is where Romans started out. There is not a single person in this room that has not experienced the brokenness of relationships because of these obstacles, internal and external. Not a single one of you here doesn't have that pain. It might be extended family, it might be a spouse, it might be a child, it might be a friend, it might be a work colleague. Every single one of you that can hear my voice that's sitting here knows the pain that sin brings into relationships. And every one of you have struggled with some of these internal obstacles. Every one of you have wanted to give up and withdraw. And every one of you have sometimes decided to do that. And COVID is just exacerbating that. COVID is driving us further and further into our little worlds and people are becoming divided about things that I never thought would divide before. In the last year, the number of difficult conversations and emails and messages I've had, people have just got so much built up anger and there's so much division in our world. Churches splitting about mask wearing and vaccinations. We're not going to have anything to do with these people because they have a different conviction about some medical procedure. That's what's happening in our world. It's becoming increasingly polarized. And the gospel says God sent his son and Jesus left the comforts of heaven on a mission to reconcile sinners to himself. And he went the way of the cross and when he was reviled, he did not revile. And when he was falsely accused, he did not defend himself. But as 1 Peter 3 says, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And Jesus came on a mission to reconcile men to God and men to one another. Remember how Romans started? We were all, the whole world, full of all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Do you hear about how this has got to do with relationships? Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. Do you hear how this has got to do with relationships? They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God. Do you hear how this has got to do with relationships? Broken because of sin. And it goes on to say in Romans 3, their mouths are full of curse and curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is the problem that the book of Romans sets out before us. That the gospel goes on to address. It makes sense then that when we come to the application of the gospel in Romans chapter 12, what is the gospel going to call us to address? The brokenness of our world and our relationships. Let this just sink in for a moment. Romans 1 to 11 is basically the explanation of the gospel and its implications. And Romans 12 to 16 is the application of the gospel. Every chapter has to do with sowing peace in some form or another. Every chapter. Every chapter that seeks to apply the gospel in the letter to Romans applies it to the issue of relationships. Just look in your Bibles, Romans 13. Let every person, verse 1, be subject to the governing authorities, sowing peace in relation to authority. Verse 8, owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed in up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 14, 1, 
As for the one who's weak in the faith, welcome him not to quarrel over opinions, sowing peace in relation to those with different convictions. Romans 15, 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. It goes on to say in verse 5, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Reconciliation, peace, sowing peace in the midst of diversity. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18 I appeal to you as he closes out his letter, brothers, watch out for those who do what? Cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. What is contrary to the gospel? Divisions. What characterizes your life, your family, your relationships? What characterizes the church? Divisions. And the gospel calls us to a different way. And it gives us the power to be different. The gospel gives us a sword, a healing balm, a sword to do battle, not against other people. Because if we think we're going to move out in relationships and create peace without war, we're wrong. Listen to me. The gospel calls us to war. It calls us to war in order to establish peace. War not against people, but against the sin that causes division. The sin out there, but the sin in here most specifically. The sin in my own heart that causes me to break relationships with people. Christ is calling you to establish peace, to be a peacemaker, a peace sower. And he's given you the only weapon that's powerful enough to do that. And it is the gospel, applied to your own heart and then brought into the relationships. So may I encourage you, let's leave the comfort and the safety of our little bubbles and the isolation and let's carry the gospel with us into the pain and into the brokenness and into the difficulty that we find ourselves in in all these manifold different kinds of relationships and let us carry the gospel there and apply its healing balm so that Jesus might be honored in our lives and that the gospel might be adorned in our relationships. Let the glory of God shine in the darkness and the pain and the suffering that you encounter in these very real relationships so that people can see his glory let's pray father what a glorious calling and what an amazing example we have in your son jesus we praise you as the the great conqueror of sin and death the one who's obliterated every obstacle that stood in the way between an almighty and all-holy God and wicked, lost, wretched sinners. We praise you that you exemplified grace and mercy to the very last breath that you took. We marvel that you asked God to forgive those who were persecuting you and who crucified you to a cross. And we're astounded that even as the thieves lay um, um, insults, hurled insults at you, Yet you returned with grace and mercy, and one of them saw your love and your grace. And in those last moments, he was converted. Father, help us to be like your son. Please help us to think upon this gospel, to apply this gospel of grace and mercy and unconditional acceptance, to be like you in the way we treat other people. Please transform the relationships, Lord, starting with the ones in our own home, in our own life. Please transform the relationships in this church. Lord, as we are seeking to come together across such economic disparity and cultural diversity, 
Father, only your gospel can help us get across this chasm. Help us to apply the gospel and to have genuine unity. Help us, Lord, to go into those very painful relationships where we were withdrawn and we don't even want to go there. And help us to take the gospel and apply it to our hearts and to those people as healing for the nations. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Enjoy your Sunday. Remember the members meeting at 10.30, some fellowship afterwards, and pray at 5. Thank you.